Feel like you're being pulled in a thousand directions? Let's fix that. Download your free rebalancing toolkit and learn how to design an optimized week that lets you feel like you have it all. Get the goods at brilliantbalance.net slash have it all. I'm Sherilyn Skolnicki, and this is Brilliant Balance, the show for working women who are ready to shine. Each week, I bring you ideas, inspiration, and insight on balance, business, and getting it all done gracefully. You ready? Let's be brilliant. Hello, and welcome to episode four of the Brilliant Balance podcast. Hey, before we settle in today to talk about choices, which is really the topic for today, I want to give you fair warning that the content we cover today may make you a little uncomfortable. And I'm saying that because we're going to be challenging one of those really socially acceptable pat phrases that a lot of us use to let ourselves off the hook or to let other people off the hook. And when we get challenged and asked to let go of one of those and really examine what's underneath it, it can be a little uncomfortable. Um, So stay with me, bear with me through the discomfort, and let's see if we can get somewhere good with this topic of choices today. There are really three main points that I'm going to make, and we're going to take them one by one. But the big thing I want to challenge is... I want you to think about a time that you've ever heard yourself say, well, I just don't really have a choice, or what choice do I have? And I bet if you spend just a minute thinking about a time that you regularly use that as your response, uh, maybe you say, it is what it is, or maybe you say, um, that's just how things have to be right now, right? All of those are sort of different articulations of the same notion that I don't really have a choice right? This just is what I'm dealing with. And what I'm going to challenge today is, is that true? Is it really true that you don't have a choice? And the first point I want to make is almost everything is a choice. It's just a whole lot easier to say that it's not because then we don't have to take responsibility for our choices, right? Like let's say, for example, that you are out on a road trip, on a weekend, you're driving someplace, and you have to stop at the fast food restaurant to get a burger and fries because it's late and everybody's starving and that's the only thing at this exit, what choice did we have? Well, a few, right? One choice might be stopping someplace where it would take a longer time to have the meal, but there would be better choices. Another might be um, packing a lunch at home before you leave and bringing it with you so you can eat it whenever you get hungry. You know, you might even order something different from the very same drive through right? Picking up like a grilled chicken salad instead of the burger and fry or whatever it is. There are choices. A really big example that comes up a lot is um, I'm in this job that I hate because it pays well and it has good benefits, you know, so what choice do I really have? Well, a few. You know, one might be looking for another job that pays equally well, but gets you into something that you really love. One might be taking a lower paying job and then adjusting your expenses accordingly. One might be I don't know, finding a new assignment in the same company, you know, that you find more fulfilling, but that has the same compensation. There are choices. So in some instances, when things are happening to us or around us that we don't have control over, we can rightfully say, I don't have a choice, right? I don't have a choice that the sun is going to set at a particular time tonight. I don't have a choice about that. You know, I don't have a choice that at a certain point my body is going to be exhausted and fall asleep. Um, I can do lots of things to try to manipulate that, but I don't really have a choice. I certainly don't have a choice about how someone else behaves around me, but I have a choice about how I respond to it. So I want to challenge this assumption that virtually everything is really a choice. And 
where are we just taking the easy way out by saying that we don't have a choice? Okay, that's the first point that I want you to sit with and really think about. The second point is, you know, what you are calling a lack of choice may just be a choice you're not willing to make. It's a little bit of a tongue twister, right? But it might just be that there are choices and you may even be aware of them. You're just inherently not willing to make them because you don't want to tolerate the consequences, right? Like you don't like the trade-offs. So, you know, here's an example. My kids don't like vegetables, so I have to serve chicken nuggets every night. Uh, Or my boss sends me emails late at night, so I have to respond to them. I have no choice. In each of those cases, if you think about what would the choice be, it's probably starting to surface for you now because this is going to make some sense. What's the choice around if my kids don't like vegetables, I have to serve, you know, fill in the blank kid friendly food that they do like? Maybe you could serve what you know you want them to be eating and is good for their bodies, but you'd have to tolerate some whining or you'd have to tolerate some evenings of them going to bed without finishing their meal and still being a little bit hungry, you know, until their palate adjusts. Or you'd have to tolerate, you know, the discord and the complaining leaning up to that meal. And honestly, I think sometimes, I know for me, if I say I don't have a choice, it's it's sometimes just I don't want to deal with those consequences. And so because I'm not willing, I take those choices out of consideration and it becomes a very limited set of what I'm willing to consider. You know, and I mentioned this example of if you're in a pattern where your boss or your team at work is sending emails all through the night, maybe you're on a global team and you're just getting hammered with communication 24-7, so you have to respond. If you really think about the second half of that sentence, it's, or I would go into work in the morning with a full inbox. Or I might have somebody say, why don't I have a response from you yet? I sent you that email last night at 1130. But you could make the choice to tolerate those consequences and reclaim that part of your day for yourself or for your family. It would require you to tolerate, you know, some questions or a backlog at another time. And what I find, especially in the women I work with, is that often developing a little bit of tolerance for judgment, you know, by other people or a little bit of conflict in the way we choose to do something versus the way someone in our circle might choose to do it, a little bit of tolerance for judgment can really go a long way toward improving your life. Because the alternative is resentment, right? The alternative is, fine, I'll do it your way. I don't have a choice. And so we give in and we give in and we give in, but there's this seething resentment under the surface that eventually erupts, right? We lose our temper. We have a big fight with someone. There's a falling out because over time, that inability to have the difficult conversation or to tolerate the judgment has sort of, you know, we've given away so much of ourselves in the way we want to live our lives. So I see this from my seat a lot as it relates to work, you know, to the expectations that we believe are being placed on us at work. I hear it a lot in marriages and relationships in terms of the expectations being placed on us there. And I hear it a lot in parenting that, you know, when the kids won't do X, Y, or Z, and so I don't have a choice, or I have to do X, Y, or Z for the kids, and so I don't have a choice. So my invitation to you in this arena is, You know, when you are saying, I don't have a choice, give yourself permission to complete that sentence, right? Or else, I don't have a choice, or else I would have to tolerate this person's judgment, this person's whining, this person's whatever, okay? Because often that's where you'll find the solution. The breakthrough is, but if I could learn to tolerate that, could I get a different outcome, right? If I could learn to tolerate that, could things look and feel a little different? Could I feel a little more freedom and and flexibility in how I can maneuver? And that's powerful. That's super powerful when we start to find our territory where we can maneuver. 
feel like you're being pulled in a thousand directions? Let's fix that. Download your free rebalancing toolkit and learn how to design an optimized week that lets you feel like you have it all. Get the goods at brilliantbalance.net slash have it all. Okay, the third thing that kind of plays in this area of choice is a pattern where sometimes we make a choice without even realizing it. And then that one choice becomes a way of life. Now, that can play out in a really positive way. Like maybe you make the choice to go in to work every day on time. It's just your pattern. So you get up on time, you get out the door on time, you show up on time. Or maybe you make a choice in your life to go to church every Sunday. And it's it's not a choice anymore because you've made a decision to uphold that as a standard. Those can be good choices. They're very positive habits that are formed by an initial choice, an initial decision to uphold a standard. And when they're good and productive ones, then we don't notice them very much because they're working for us, right? But when a choice that we make once, we kind of set it and forget it, is not serving us, or maybe it used to serve us, but it's not serving us anymore, and we haven't noticed, and therefore we haven't changed, that's when there's a problem. And so if you got into a pattern of, I'm going to leave work at a certain time, and then I'm going to come home, and I'm going to stay up till midnight to catch up on things I didn't finish, and then I'm tired, really tired, and I'm kind of passing out on the couch and groggily going to bed later and getting up in the morning tired and repeating the whole cycle the next day. That's one of those choices we make that that kind of starts a negative cycle that we can't easily get out of without making a different choice, right? Like let's take that staying up till midnight to catch up on work. Um, and I know a lot of times the women I'm working with, that's a pattern they'll be in because they've carved out the evening as time to dedicate to their children. So they get up early, they go into it, they get the kids off to school, they go to work. They work until they have to be home to be engaged with the kids' activities and make dinner and do homework. And then they pick it up again. And they stay, They need that night shift to finish what they think is the expectation of a work day. So maybe they left at 5 or 5.30 or 6 and they weren't finished. There's just more work piling up because other people are staying longer, right? So they have that that next shift that they're doing. Well, at some point that becomes normal and it feels like there is no choice. I will never get caught up if I don't keep working until midnight every night, all right? So this is where we want to insert a new decision point, a new moment of choice, and ask, you know, what is it costing you to maintain this choice, this decision as a habit, as a pattern? And ask yourself, what would happen if you didn't do it? Because sometimes there's a um, inflated sense of what will happen of the, what the negative consequences might be if we if we do change a pattern. So let's use the same example of staying up late to catch on work. What would happen if you didn't do it? Well, the first thing that would happen is you would probably feel further behind. If we just play it out, right? In the initial days, you'd probably feel further behind because that shift that you're used to using to get work done wouldn't be available. So there would be a backlog. And then the backlog might get a little bigger, it might get a little bigger again. And at a certain point, you would have to renegotiate what was a reasonable amount of work to complete. I think we think, like our imaginations run to, well, I'm going to get fired, or somebody else is going to get this job, or somebody else is going to be willing to do it. I'm just saying, maybe there's another way. Maybe what happens is we get a whole lot better at editing down the tasks that we do at work all day long so that we get the highest leverage things done and the lowest priority stuff falls to the bottom and maybe it gets cut completely. You know, may, Have you ever had that experience where somebody sends you an email and you don't respond right away and then later you go back to them to say, oh, I missed this one and I'm ready to address it and they're like, oh, we took care of it. It's handled. I remember the first time I had that experience and I thought, whoa, wait a minute. (laughs) You know, maybe if I just tap the brakes on this instant response that I feel compelled to give, sometimes people will solve their own problem. 
And that's actually reducing my workload, right? I'm not suggesting that you become irresponsible, but sometimes the lowest priority things will just sort of magically fall off the plate if you give them a little time and space, right? If you are more careful about editing. One of the things we talk about a lot with the women that I coach is that if we don't declare the boundaries around how much work we can do, no one else really has visibility to that. You know, our boss doesn't really know that we're working this many extra hours. They really don't. They don't have visibility to what's going on inside of our house. Even if they're getting emails from us, they don't know what's happening in between. They don't really know what's viable for one human being to complete at work. That's up to us to communicate. And I think we often internalize it as there's something wrong with us, that you know we're not productive enough, we're not efficient enough, we can't get enough done. So there's a lot of fear driving these um, I have no choice statements. And this just one vector of it is I'm really passionate about it because I see how much pain it causes when the time that we have to allocate to work gets bigger and bigger and bigger and starts to infiltrate you know, zones of our day that we had initially protected for other things like sleep, you know, like time with our spouse or time with our children. And you can do that for a while. You can sprint like that for a while. But when you declare it as it's no longer a choice, it is, this is a way of life now. This is how I have to do it. I don't have any other options. That's dangerous. You know, and that's the pattern that I want us to challenge with these concepts today. So, you know, just to kind of go back through these this three points we're making today about choice and do you really have a choice? The first is, you know, it's my point of view that almost everything is a choice. At a minimum, we have a choice in how we react to it, how we respond to it. And if we claim that, then we feel a much higher sense of control over our lives, which is a much more empowered state to be in than feeling victimized by, you know, we don't have a choice. Second point we made is, you know, what you may be calling a lack of choice or labeling a lack of choice is really a choice you're not willing to make. It's a set of consequences you're not willing to deal with. And so if you can challenge yourself to build a tolerance for withstanding some of these consequences like judgment or conflict, um, you may find that that opens up a wider set of choices than you originally thought you had. And then the third point is, you know, sometimes we make a choice and that one choice becomes a way of life and we forget that it was a choice that can be made differently. You know, so my challenge there would be always be evaluating your habits, your patterns that you've fallen into to question, you know, am I at a different place now? Do I need to make a different choice to bring the overall picture of my life more in alignment with you know, the vision that I have for this chapter. Maybe you set a pattern before you had kids and now that pattern's not working. And so can you make a different choice, right? So the next time you hear yourself saying, you know, well, what choice do I have? Or um, it is what it is, you know, and you're asking that question like it's rhetorical, what choice do I have? Stop and ask yourself to answer the question for real. You know, what choice do you have? Would you be willing to make a different one? How might you be able to test that out um, and see if you can withstand the consequences? I think you'll find that there is um, just an incredible freedom when that range of possibilities starts to open up. But I will tell you that, you know, this reminder that you have way more choices than you may be claiming today is going to feel a little uncomfortable. It's really connected to taking personal responsibility for our situation. And that's uncomfortable because then we're on the hook for the outcomes. But if we remember that we really do have choices, then we can choose a path forward that really works for us, right? That really kind of gets us back in the groove that we want to be in, in this chapter. In fact, Next week, we're going to talk about one really big manifestation of this I have no choice syndrome. And I call it um, toughing it out. 
You know, sometimes we get into that pattern of, um, I'm just going to tough it out. I, I don't have a choice, so I'm going to tough it out because eventually this is going to break and I'm going to feel better and things are going to fall into place. And so I'm going to share a little bit about when that is a good idea and when it's most definitely not. <laughs> so you can look for any places where you might be in that pattern of, you know, essentially playing the martyr without even realizing it. So that's it for today. That's a that's a thought provoking series of questions that I want you to take away with you. And um, if you were challenged by this and you thought this got your thinking going in a new and productive direction, um, I'd love to hear from you. You know, take a few seconds to rate the show, drop a comment, write a review, or share it with someone who you think could be impacted by hearing these concepts for themselves. Sharing is awesome. You know, the more the merrier, the more people we can get claiming these choices, the better off we're going to be. So that's it till next time. And until I catch you again, go be brilliant. This is the podcastfactory.com.